The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. In this video, we're going after a desktop pinball game. Now this is, is, it's not new by any stretch, but it's not old, old, it's not like a vintage game. Uh, and you can probably tell it's, it's not, it's not going to be the high-end quality of some of the things we've torn down in the past. It's pretty fun though, I mean, there's some mechanical ingenuity that's gone into this and I can't remember where the power button is, there we go, on. And uh, you know, it's, it's not going to revolutionise anybody's world, but it's a fun, cheapish toy. Not that I'm a pinball wizard. But you know, it's it's good, cheap fun. There's clearly electronics in it to make the sound reproduction and control a few things. It's not perfectly functional, but I think you can probably glean what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and I think it's kind of important. We do a lot of um, potentially expensive, this is why I try and find a lot of broken stuff because I can't bring myself to break stuff that is not already broken. But you know, I feel it's kind of good to look at both ends of the spectrum. And I think what we're gonna find in here, not that it's bad practice, but it is the type of electronics that are built down to a price. They're for quick batch productions that are looking for the cheapest way to arrive at a solution. Uh, I don't want to say it's nasty, but I'm not expecting high-end electronics in here. But there's still cool stuff that we can learn and use in our own projects. So let's start with the obvious. Now that we're going to come back to later because I think it's going to actually be quite interesting because this is essentially a pulse counter. Every time this is going to, well, I think, <laughs> I think this is going to be a pulse counter. Every time these contacts send a voltage up here, there's going to be some mechanism which just rocks this round to the next score. And all that does is count and count and count. So I want, I want to come back to that later because I think that's going to be quite cool as a basic electronic component. This on the other hand, let's start with batteries. I mean, actually, just while we're looking at the bottom side of this, these, that's, it's, again, it serves the purpose. But it goes to show that on the underside, the back side, the hidden sides, you don't need to spend hours filling, sanding, making sure your 3D print is perfect or whatever the case may be. You can get away with less polish on your parts. Oh. Do you know what? That's there's actually a little smudge of leftover oh, very manky flux from when they soldered those in position which is a weird choice since they're totally removable. And actually the colors are just little washers on the back of the plastic screen. I kind of, no, I don't think I really thought they were the colored lamps or anything, but uh, yeah, that still seems pretty novel as an approach. Of course the flippers just lift off nice and easy. They're all exactly not exactly the same, of course, there's two-handed versions. Oh. Oh. I hadn't expected anything really amazing, but bless it. So our five lamps, and they are actually lamps, these are not LEDs, and we've got springs and metal contact plates, these just look like steel, and they're just pressed onto cardboard, there isn't... That is just a cardboard printout. Also in here we have a speaker. That's the power switch, which just feeds through to the bottom and a tiny little PCB. And always the, the, the hallmark of quality, the massive glob of hot glue to hold something in place. Granted, it's a speaker. It would be really annoying if it had a really tinny vibration noise because it wasn't held in place well enough. And the last actual electronic component, I guess, is some big steel plates that sort of masquerade up as a leaf switch. It's this little uh... <laughs> it's 
full release mechanism. You can just see it's got the one, two, three, zero on it. And every time the ball is in position and it chucks it over. That's clever, I like that. And that's it, that's a really simple physical assembly. Uh, not much in the way of parts, not much in the way of extra materials. And yeah, it's just kind of funny that you can sort of see the milling marks from the mold that have actually imprinted on the plastics, but it's all hidden, it doesn't matter. And the other thing that's interesting is the number of screws that you've got in a few places. I would say this back shell, this back case, is probably used for a number of different machines with probably added features, different types of lights, more functions. That's just clever manufacturing, one mold making multiple games. Why not? Good economical sense. Right, now we're here. I'm, like I say, I really want to know how this should have worked. Obviously it doesn't at the moment, but I'd quite like to uh, give this a look because I'm thinking that might be solenoid actuated. Probably gonna kick myself for making that sort of prediction. And as predicted, that screwdriver's too short. Oh man, that one's too big. Okay, what have I got? What have I got? What have I got? Think fast. I'm back having dug around in my toolbox. This looks like it's probably older than I am. <sighs> Still too big. All right, nobody look. Just screwdriver that got overloved. Okay. Well, if nothing else, that looks like it could well have a motor in it. Oh, that'd be why well, that stopped working then. All right, it's okay to, to be economic with your design. It's okay to be like economic with your components if your design will stand the test of time. What it's not okay to be is economic with your manufacturing because if it falls apart, no one's gonna want it. So build quality aside, I kind of still expected this to be a solenoid. I was expecting some sort of mechanism to go chunk, 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 one score at a time. But what I'm seeing here with the two wires going inside this case with uh, a capacitor, which is also looking a bit suspect if I'm honest, um, makes me think motor and the gears coming out the end of the shaft too. So motor, capacitor, some very crusty looking terminals. This is starting to make some of mine work look good. A couple of gears to reduce the output shaft. Right, I will take this apart, but it's too cool. I'm actually keep this assembly for something else. So for each point you get, all this will do is send a little pulse out to the motor for a set length of time. And once that's gone round for the first 900 points, then it mechanically ticks over, <laughs> half over, to the next, and so on and so on and so on. I wonder how quickly you could fire this up and you'd still get the points counted correctly. And then once you reach your high score, you just set 999, because it only moves up in hundreds anyway, so there's no need for a high score to save us. See, I like that little mechanism. This, this whole unit might get used again someday. Oh, and then you've got a physical reset, which lifts all the gears clear at the bottom. It looks like they're slightly spring-loaded, so they return to zero. Cool. Ah, <gasps> oh, cool. Comes off as a module. Oh, and you just see that on this shaft, on the, uh, this shaft, on the end of this cylinder, there's just two teeth next to what would be the relative position for zero, zero, zero. So as you progress this round, those two teeth eventually bite on this purple gear and progress the next one. And there's, again, two teeth there to progress the next one. And you've got these two little nylon detents at the bottom just to make sure it actually stops in the right place. Which is only interesting because it didn't when we were just trying it in the face here. Ah, okay. So on the end of this shaft, if I spin that round, you can sort of see there's a cam shape here. Now that cam is biased, so when we push the reset and lift the teeth clear of the uh, shaft at the bottom, it's actually the cams that are pushing it all back to zero. So I thought that was somehow spring-loaded, but that's clever because then, depending on the shape and design of the cam, it doesn't matter where you are, it's always gonna push to that flat side on zero, zero, zero. Let's have a look at the electronics on cardboard. Now, I can't think of another time I've seen electronics pressed onto cardboard. I mean, if it works for the, 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 the 
the project in hand, then why not? You know, if you made this out of sheet aluminium and pressed it and had uh, etching the, to expose traces and stuff, it'd cost 10 times as much and probably be no more or less enjoyable. Um, so the springs in the centre are going to be on the same circuit as the base, that metal washer type thing we did in the base. That spring in the centre all goes to this cross, which goes back to there, purple. I mean, it, of course, there's no need for it to be polarised. There's no, no circuitry that's going to interfere with that. So the fact that the ball bearing, when it hits one of these, make contact with the base and the spring is enough. And then we have this tiny little ASIC application specific integrated circuit and awful lot of stuff soldered down here on the uh, negative terminal. I'm assuming that's negative. It certainly looks it. And yeah, they've just basically paralleled every negative onto that one trace on the PCB. I wouldn't call it the best practice ever, but again, it works. Then you've got a couple of outputs. Um, so you've got two going this way. One goes to that lamp. And that one goes to that lamp, but those three lamps come off of there. I seem to remember them all flashing at once. I don't see why you would use two separate traces. So three transistors on board. It looks like these two are switching lamp outputs. And this one is being used as a really high quality audio amplifier. And then of course, controlling the whole lot, you've just got this tiny little glop top over here. And it's got the sound, the storage for the sound in here and enough playback capacity. You know, it's a fun toy and that's what it's designed to do. You don't need tons of power, you don't need screens, you don't need uh, a high quality audio output boards, drivers, um, multiple sounds. And this is enough to keep someone entertained, especially under certain conditions, for a very long time because it's a game of skill. The electronics are there just to enhance the experience, they're not the core of the experience. And I think that's kind of a uh, an interesting thing. I mean, I'm looking at a project at the moment for myself where it could be done with thermostats and relays. But my instinct was, well, I'm going to get an Arduino. I'm going to get some temperature sensors. I'm going to write this script. Why? If it will function perfectly with really simple electronics, why overcomplicate it? You're adding to your bill of material, you're adding to your overheads, you're adding to your cost of materials, you're adding to things that can go wrong. Keep it simple. If it works for the function you need it to do, it's good enough. And this is good enough for a pinball machine. I know it's the other end of the spectrum, but I still hope you found this an interesting teardown. Uh, if you have an idea for a teardown yourself, head over to the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.